Hello and welcome to the Mustard's podcast. I am David Mustard and you are Jenny Mustard and today we have a special guest. We have my mentor Rowan Hisayu Buchanan. Welcome Rowan. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for coming on. Clap, 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 clap. (laughs) We don't have effects today. (laughs) So Rowan, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm really excited to talk to you because not only are you an amazing author, you're also my one and only mentor. Um, so do you like, and good friend and good friend yes uh, so before we get into all that do you just want to introduce yourself and your work a little bit of course um, so I'm primarily a novelist I am the author of two novels Harmless Like You and Starling Days and my third novel The Sleep Watcher comes out this April so Ooh. congratulations Yay, thank you congrats I'm nervous and excited about that um, but I also write essays and I do some teaching and some mentoring and that's how I met Jenny before yeah. realizing that she maybe, I don't know if she needed me or not. <laughs> but I think that you have forgotten to say that both of you have a PhD, so you're actually a doctor, which is uh, like quite impressive. Um, but also tell us about like being on price long lists and stuff. But, but first, if, if someone on a plane sh- shouts, we need a doctor. That's not, not that sort of job. <laughs> are, 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 you, are you like... I am one. I can't. Ha- I. I just want to say that I'm a doctor. <laughs> I can analyze some literature about people dying on planes. But, Give me um... a couple of books about being a doctor, <laughs> and I can analyze the text. <laughs> um, have you ever said those words? I'm a doctor. I have not. I've. I put it on my Amazon parcels, mm-hmm. and <gasps> I know. Wow. I know. I don't buy my books on Amazon, but right. sometimes I have bought phone charges on Amazon. All right. Okay, well, okay. We all have. That, that's we my all crime. have. Yeah. That's no, my crime. We're not judging. Um, <laughs> do, do you use it uh, like when, when you fill in forms and, and things like that? Yes, because does it give you joy? It put? does. Give, it does give me joy. Also, I. I'm not a huge fan of Miss and I'm not a huge mm. fan of Misses. And mm. so it feels quite nice to be able to be like, Doctor, you mm. don't know me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we have a friend who's a doctor of fashion. Ooh. So that's also like, yeah, I, I can uh, I can analyze I can your outfit. I can mend a shirt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is that what she does? <laughs> no, I don't think she can mend a shirt, actually. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, back, back to your prices. Brag a little bit. Okay, so... My first novel, Harmless Like You, won the Authors Club First Novel Award. It won a Betty Trask Award. It was shortlisted for the Desmond Elliott. So, and a couple of other things. Um, I also got made the Gladstone Library Writer in Residence because wow. of that book. It it was lovely. Um, and my second novel, Starling Days, was shortlisted for the Costa Novel Award, which sadly no longer exists. Yeah, that's weird. I know. Well... I don't really understand the exact politics behind it, but mm. totally biased. I shall miss it. Yeah. Which prize was that? Costa. The, the Costa Novel Award. Oh yeah, yeah. You 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 told me about that. That's David, like David. You're it, such an illiterate in the. In, in no, this no, world. yeah. Like the audience doesn't know all of this well, either. Have, so so the I am I am the audience. You like yeah. in the UK you have the Booker, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And then you have the Costa, who no longer exists, and yeah. then there's the Women's Prize. Those yeah. are like the three big ones wouldn't you say Rod? yeah I, I mean you know it's it's hard to say what i i feel like those are the ones people's mothers are likely to know about yeah oh, so my okay. mother was very excited for me <laughs> about Costa, that one. is it like the coffee yeah. yes it is like the coffee that that's incredible yeah i mean they like that's how they d- do it nowadays with the prices like they just put like whoever sponsors the price gets oh to call it's the it's price like when it wasn't uh, used to call the cost it was uh, called something else it's like uh before. when arenas are yes, called things like uh, um the uh, uh, Staples Center in, in the U in LA it was called Staples after Staples, but now it's called Crypto dot com yeah, Arena. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be happy to like be uh, get an award called Crypto dot com Award? I mean, I don't think I know enough about crypto. <laughs> I think I'd have to do some research <laughs> yeah. to find out, you know, how what these people were like. <laughs> if the Costa uh, a- Award, crypto. yeah, if they change name <laughs> to, to the, the Crypto, crypto Award. <laughs> you, then you have to start saying I was shortlisted for, for that. Crypto. Well, I don't know what you do because I know that the Women's Prize used to be Bailey's. It, it? Well, it was the Orange Prize, and then it became the Bailey's, mm. and then after the drink, and then someone else sponsored it, but they decided it was too confusing that it kept switching names, so yeah. it just became uh, the Women's Prize. Mm. And then I think it says like underneath who's sponsoring uh, it. Mm-hmm. 
And That's so I, better. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if people retroactively change yeah. on books or they just say, oh, I won the Baileys and hope that people remember that the Baileys <laughs> is the women's yeah, prize. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but okay, so, you know, because if, like, if there are any authors listening or, like, aspiring authors, that moment when you're told, I mean, you've been told so many times now, so maybe now you're being jaded, but, like, that moment when you're told that Another you've been prize. long-listed or short-listed <laughs> or actually won an award, how does that feel? Like, is it different for every award or is it the same sort of feeling? Oh, goodness. I mean... You know, there are people who've won much grander awards than I have. I mean, you should probably, if you can get him, you should ask Ishiguro how it felt to win the Nobel. Yeah. But, um, I, of course, I think it's always wonderful to hear that someone enjoyed your work. Mm-hmm. Because... Which was the first one that you were longlisted for? Do you remember? I don't remember now. It might have been the Desmond Elliott, which I made I made it the shortlist. And I think Francis Bufford won my year mm-hmm. with the Golden Hill. Mm-hmm. So, and I begrudge him not. Um, and you say that, but like deep down inside, you hate him. I did an event with him recently and he was lovely. So, oh, right. I can't. so you, you couldn't even hate him. I couldn't hate him. He, he should have been a bitch to you so that you could, like, you would have, would have been allowed to hate him. Yeah. yeah. But I think, he wasn't, uh, he, he didn't deserve it. <laughs> but I think that's, I think that's the thing about, you know, the fact that there are sort of a bunch of prizes out there is that you realize that there are, as you know judges are not they're each well, they're all individuals mm-hmm. and so you know that you might get shortest for one prize you might win another one you know it was wonderful to get the authors club one and you know that felt really good it felt mm-hmm. really good to you know it's just you spend most of your time writing alone yeah thinking is anyone going to like this yeah. is anyone going to enjoy or this? even read it yes or even read it so to have someone say and i not only read it but i want to celebrate you or something you did is particularly special and for some of them they'll say why they thought your book was worthy and Mm. that yeah it's very it's very moving Mm. so yeah do do you ever read uh, reviews i tend to well online i only read reviews by readers where they've tagged me and like on Twitter, or on Twitter or Instagram, because in general, I feel like it's a bad path to go down <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to start trying to eavesdrop, essentially, on yeah. what other people think. Yeah. I think every author should stay away from Amazon and Goodreads. But yeah, and oh, did you ever go to Goodreads and like just gonna go, just gonna check a couple? Of... Oh, I hope you don't. I did in the beginning, but I think I decided that two things. One, that it was really for readers, it wasn't for writers, and mm-hmm. that's not what it was about. And mm. secondly, that I think at the time I was looking, this may have changed, but there were like several Toni Morrison books that had like 3.5 stars. Yeah. Mm. And I remember thinking, well, okay, what what do we learn from this? Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I think people's tastes differ quite yes. widely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there's some part of me, like the good nerdy student that wants every single person to give me five stars yeah. yeah but if they're not if every single person is not giving the great tony morrison five stars why am i going to put myself but down like, that path? See, like would you really want that though like because you know one part of you obviously wants everyone to love you but at the same time if everyone likes your book doesn't that mean that you're kind of not really doing your job as a literary author do you know what i mean like aren't aren't you supposed to kind of ruffle a few feathers or like i don't know do you are you really writing for everyone or are you writing for people who vibe with your particular like way of expressing yourself or looking at the world or whatever? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a lovely way of putting it. The thing I sort of tell myself is that there are people who just as people mm. you know, go about the world and everyone goes, oh, so-and-so is really nice. And they probably are really nice, but people aren't particularly close to. Mm. And... You can also be the sort of person who has some incredibly close friends with incredibly meaningful friendships. And a lot of people don't get where you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think b- <sighs> books are on some level the most polished, crafted distillation of your worldview. And mm-hmm. that's always going to connect with some people and not with other people. And you sort of have to let let that let that be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it's hard though because as you say like no one wants a two-star review and like some mean words about that like your most polished like you said it's just, you, it's, you you spend so much time polishing something and and trying to create something that's like artful and then have a two-star review obviously it's a nice but that's why you should like read them i guess like you stay away from them well to all our listeners you can uh, give us five stars on all your podcast apps and so. you, can, you can also <laughs> give rowan's uh, first two novels uh, stars already now um <laughs> exactly. we have to wait a bit for your so so what's okay let's talk about your third one then uh do you want to tell us what it's about of course so mm-hmm. the sleep watcher is my third novel and it's narrated by a woman looking back on her teenage years in this small British seaside town when she started to have these out-of-body experiences at night where instead of dreaming or sleeping, she would find herself wandering around her house and her town. But she can't fly. She doesn't have a wand. She doesn't have any (laughs) magical powers. So she's instead forced to witness the goings-on within her family and her community. And she sees things that she hadn't seen in the day and force it forces her to have to re-understand uh okay um so i haven't read it yet i'm still waiting for my like pre-review copy to to read um how many stars you're gonna give (laughs) yeah (laughs) i'm gonna i'm gonna gonna give you a nice quote for sure i already know that i'm gonna love it because i have so far loved everything you've written um but i didn't know that it was about like her looking back so that's interesting so she's like retrospectively having to like change her own view about her childhood is that the concept she's so she's actually she's writing this book to her lover and she's confessing about what happened that year in her past and i did that for a number of reasons but one of them is i think that for many of us when we're becoming close to someone when we're falling in love with them or just becoming intimate with them. There are certain stories we have about how we became the person we are, Mm -hmm. informative stories. And I wanted that, I wanted that to be part of the book that for her, it is not just that these things happened, but they've shaped who she became. Mm. And I think for me, you know, I think a lot of the time the media can be quite dismissive of teenagers, Mm. but a lot of our important experiences do happen then and can shape the adults that we are. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of partly why I chose that voice. I mean, don't you say that? I I love a good coming of age story. Yeah, I mean, that's why we all love them, right? Like, I I watch coming of age movies all the time. Yeah. Like, that's that's my favorite. (laughs) And I think, like, don't you usually say that, like, the brain's, like, um, elasticity sort of... Uh, you you lose that when you're like around 20 so everything that happens before is sort of like that's actually changing the way your brain works and it will stay like that for like till you die like you can't really do anything about it so like what happens to you between I don't know 12 and 20 that's like those are the golden years for like deciding who you are as a person, which is quite scary after that you don't learn anything new no but... <laughs> after that like you, after that your brain is trying to tell you that like the so when you're between like 12 and 20 you learn about the world and you're trying to figure out what the world is but after 20 you're trying to tell yourself that what you already know about the world is the truth and then trying to f- make the world fit into your worldview instead of do you know you know what i mean yeah, yeah. It yeah. it's terrifying it's really scary to think about it that way because it's too late for all of us now <laughs> like we just have to so that so that's why we probably we can't change from now on no so that's why we probably will write the same sort of books have the same sort of perspective on life from like the first book we write until the last one. Do okay. Is is that why like a lot of people do their best work in their early, like I'm not talking about writers but like you know scientists that like they have their, their amazing I- ideas in their twenties like and then mathematicians. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then when they're forty, they just look at their fantastic students and what ideas they. I have. think we should stop talking about this because it is so depressing to think about. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you, you don't think so? No, no, not you at feel all. like your best work is behind you, David. Uh, no, no. Uh, the creative things I do is are different from mathematics. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> that's that's. Do you do you feel like you're like? Are you sure that you're getting better? Do you get better as a writer? Like because you've written three now. I've, I'm only I've only written one, so I'm not sure like how the second one will compare. 
So when I was starting out as a writer, because my first book came out when I was 26, which means I started writing it when I was about 23, I spoke to someone who will remain nameless, who told me, you're too young to have anything to say. Go work on an oil rig. Okay. And I'm sure there are some really wonderful oil rig novels out there mm-hmm. or to be written. And I remember... <laughs> <laughs> to be written. I, but I remember feeling furious <laughs> because it implied that the two decades that I'd spent living were meaningless and generic and must be the same as everyone else's. Mm. Mm. And I I really do not think that is true. And I think that, yes, some some individuals find the thing they want to talk about when they're in their 70s or their 60s, but that being young does not mean you have less to write about. I think in terms of craft, it's a something slightly different, mm-hmm. which is how how used to shaping your ideas mm. are you? What, how familiar are you with certain techniques? And on one level, I do think it is easier as you go just to believe that you'll be able to do it, mm-hmm. to believe that you'll be able to finish a book. Mm-hmm. Because I know a lot of people who haven't done that and they get stuck on the first chapter and they lose confidence. Yeah. And they go, oh my goodness, there's so many more pages. Yeah. <laughs> and at least you have the sort of feeling of like, if I keep plugging away, eventually this will be the length of a book. Yeah. <laughs> and then I can edit it. And so I think you have the confidence of that experience. Mm-hmm. But I also think that with every book I've needed to learn how to write again in some ways why why is that like don't tell me that (laughs) well each book has individual needs so you know we were talking about the narrator of my third novel and i spent probably about as long trying to figure out the voice of that novel Mm. as i did writing the novel all right because i couldn't figure out who i couldn't figure out the voice i couldn't figure out the tone i couldn't so how did you did you just write your way through it, just like experiment writing stuff, or how did it happen? I think basic basically, I experimented writing stuff. I thought about what sort of voice I wanted. Do you I, do like those like writing prompt things, like write about one day when she goes to the supermarket, what would she buy? Like those kind of tricks that people do. So. My secret shame mm-hmm. is that <laughs> I, when I, I studied writing and I loved doing those exercises in class and I always found them incredibly helpful. And so when I teach, I give my students exercises like that and I say, okay, you know, we're going to write about the time in which, what do we do recently? Um, oh, yes, in which you a character first formed a particular habit they have. Mm-hmm. And I send them off. And I don't do these exercises anymore. Mm. I cannot make myself do them. There's something about an authority figure saying for 20 minutes, you're going to write about this. You're like, I'm a doctor, damn it. I don't have to do this anymore. (laughs) I want to do it. I want to do it. But when I'm the boss, I start second guessing the prompt. Mm. And actually, I think they're most useful when you just accept the prompt. And then go. Someone has to tell you to do it. You can't tell yourself to do it. I mean, one can tell oneself to do mm-hmm. it. I personally have oh, failed at it oh, so yeah. far. <laughs> but, but when you studied, so so you went to university and and did, uh, what is it called here? Is it called like English or? Like... Okay, so I, confusingly for listeners, I grew up in Britain. Mm. I have a kind of American accent because my mom's American. Mm. I then went to study my undergrad in America where I told my family, I'm going to get a degree in economics. Mm. My family were like, that sounds like a good degree. They will get you a job. <laughs> Hooray, huzzah for you. Mm. And the thing about America as opposed to Britain is that you can take sort of extra classes around the side of mm. your major. And a friend of mine was like, you're always reading. Oh, are those the minors? Well, no, you don't even have to minor in it. You oh, can okay. just take, you just oh, be like, okay. I want to take a pottery class mm. yeah. and do one pottery class. So I had a friend who said, well, you're always reading novels. Like, you should take a creative writing class. And I said, oh, yeah, I, I'll do that. And I did it. And I absolutely loved it. But in order to... <laughs> it was better than economics. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> better than finance. <laughs> and and but, but to be allowed to take the higher up classes, you had to be a major. Mm. And so I then called my parents. I was like, I'm still going to major in economics, but I'm going to double major. I'm also going 
to do creative writing and my family were like suspicious Mm -hmm. but you're not going to drop the economics i was like i'm not going to drop the economics i'm just going to work really far too hard and so they they accepted this and i ended up i I still have i have a major in economics but um, how is that working out for you i don't i i enjoyed it actually are are you balancing the budget of your renovation (laughs) Uh, i i actually i did enjoy it because i think economics can just be a way to talk about how people behave and how Mm. they make choices which is i think a very bird's eye view of what a novelist is doing, or at least those are the classes I enjoy the most. So I, 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 I'm very happy I have the economics degree, even if it's been completely useless and I've gotten <laughs> my entire career and job through the creative writing side of things. That's amazing, though. I can't believe that, like, because I guess, like, most people, if you do have both degrees, you would usually end up doing the thing which is, like, more stable and easy to easier to get a job in. So it's, like, kudos for for being able to actually live off of your writing. Okay, but so um, let's move on to the other stuff you do around your writing. So you have the, you, you write your novels, you also teach and you're also doing mentor stuff. And that's how I met you. So should I set the scene? And yes, then you please. can, okay. So basically back in the day when I was just like, drafting and and trying to write back in the day so. well this is this is more than two years ago yeah yeah two and a half years ago yeah. that, that's like, like a lifetime like for me that's a long time <laughs> anyway so back in in those days those early days um i used to started following like authors and industry people on twitter to like try to learn more about the industry and you were one of the authors that i followed and uh, you followed me back uh, which i was like fangirling a little bit about i was like oh my god this author i told you something like, cloud chasers both yeah, of you yeah, yeah. i am I'm, i definitely <laughs> am i'm proud of it as well um so anyway i read um i think two or three of your short stories that i could just find online and I loved your voice so basically the first one I read was I don't remember the name of it but it's about like this woman in LA who is a like a extra teacher for a um, for a young teenage boy yes. right um and th- this was the f- like my introduction into your writing and I just I just fell in love with it immediately because it's so like deceptively simple and calm and beautiful but it has this sort of underlying darkness so you don't you have no idea where it's going so you kind of you're kind of sitting on needles at the same time as being very calm and being surrounded by like very beautiful words and and uh, uh, expressions so i was uh, yeah I, and and also the kind of very you know simple pad back writing that i usually tend to to love so i asked i i dm'd you and i asked you like do, since you're a teacher and since you like you're you know you're in the industry do you know any like good like writing creative writing courses I, I should take or what would you recommend and you like very generously gave me like a bunch of of your like suggestions and recommendations and then you also at the very end of this long dm you were like oh and by the way not to like you know self-promote but i do also do mentoring and i'm like sold like i want to do one-on-one <laughs> mentoring with Ro. like if is that i didn't even know that this is like i don't have time for a class <laughs> like, no can we, I want, can we only talk up? about me please i don't want to talk about other students <laughs> yes. so uh yeah i was like david i'm gonna i'm gonna invest in a mentoring course i need to do this they was like just do it and that's how we met yes oh i don't know if i ever told you this but back when you followed me and I followed you back. I had separately seen one of your YouTube videos. Really? And just like in in the world. And it was the one in which you were really, really excited about eating raw broccoli. Um, <laughs> all, all of her videos. <laughs> <laughs> That's like my whole YouTube career. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder what that was about. Like, do you remember what the you, what the video was you, about? You know, except for that. you know, you know what thing that happens a lot of the time Af- after. After a while, after knowing people, they usually say, by the way, years before I met you, 
I saw one of your videos, you know. It's, it's like, happened a lot of, like, lately, it's happened a lot with, like, people we've known for years. Like you, for example. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I saw one of your videos once. Yeah. But what, why was I eating raw broccoli? Do you remember? I think you were just talking about, like, what you like to eat. And you were really, really excited to be eating the raw broccoli. And you were going yeah. to David, like... I just crave raw broccoli. Don't you ever crave raw broccoli? <laughs> and you were like, what is this freak? And then a week later, I, I DM you on Twitter. Yeah, I I'm like, this is an interesting person. <laughs> Yeah, raw interesting broccoli. is the word. Like I've I've learned that like if someone ever gives you the feedback, interesting, it's that's not a good thing. I was genuinely intrigued. I was like, what 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 sort of book is is she gonna write? Like she's very. I obviously knew that you were very stylish and you had a strong set of aesthetics so i was like i had no idea what what the writing would be like and it was it was a well, so okay so when since now i have you in the hot seat today I'm, i want to grill you so please don't hold back i'm gonna ask you all about like your view because i already know my view on this mentorship thing but i want to hear <laughs> like now after it's done i want to hear like what your thoughts were so basically you so do you agree like is that how you remember it? How I contacted you and everything? Is that like I, that? Sounds very accurate. To right. me. I can't remember our exact DMs, but I there's nothing where I'm going false news. Yeah, lies. <laughs> okay, so so we just okay. This is the strange thing. This in retrospect, this could have gone really badly because I actually told you, Rowan, that I wanted to show you my first, 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 first draft. Like not even polished, not even like just typing it out, reading it through once. And then sending it to you in that really extremely raw format. Uh, and also, not when the whole first draft was done, but as I went along, I wanted to send you. And I, that's a really, really bad idea. Like, I would never do that now because I just feel like if you send that to the wrong person or that person might not understand what you're trying to do when it's so rough and like not polished at all, it could have maybe been quite disastrous but luckily you're such a lovely person and I did feel like you immediately understood what I was trying to do so it ended up being like a hugely good thing for me so basically what we did I would send you chapters and then we would meet up and discuss them and then I would go home write a few more and then we would just do that every two weeks maybe or something we would meet yeah that sounds about right uh and and the stuff we talked about in our meetings that like informed the rest of the novel so you you kind of were there to shape it um it's quite special like i've i i've never really heard anyone else do it that way which is probably a good thing maybe people shouldn't do it that way i'm not sure have you done it that way before i mean i've worked with people i don't know and it quiz people about how much they've edited before they've sent to me. I have worked with people where they don't have the whole book, where they do have individual chapters and where they're sending me and they're saying, okay, this is what I think my plot is, but mm. I don't know. And that is a really exciting time with a book. I think the thing that was really interesting to me is even though you're telling our listeners, it was so rough. It did not read that rough. <laughs> there are people who come to me and ask for mentoring where they may have an absolutely wonderful idea and absolutely the passion with the characters and I can see so much potential but they aren't yet good self-editors and a lot of what we talk about is sort of craft technique as mm. it were and you know that there's I love working with those students too but when I got your work I didn't look at this and go this woman doesn't know how to edit actually and I don't know if it's because of the YouTube and all of the editing and writing that you already do, but it felt very polished already. And I feel like a lot of our conversations weren't about, Jenny, you don't know how to write. You absolutely knew how to write when I got there. Uh, but just because so much of the characters were in your head and you knew them so well that I'd find myself asking a question saying, like, I don't quite understand why this character's made this choice or I can't quite see this motivation I trust that you know it but I think maybe I need a little bit more of it on the page and you would always know it was just that I think maybe I hope it was useful for you to have someone to bounce off and see where you needed to give the reader a bit more hand holding but yeah, all, yeah. Of, all of the skill was already there in oh those first gosh. pages <laughs> I'm blushing now I, I want you to I, I want you to also give the listener like the 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 bad stuff like okay so so <laughs> the first, the first, what what did you expect before you read did you have any expectation or were you just like this could go in like a number of different ways I don't I don't think I had a strong expectation because you know I knew 
I you just I'm just trying to think. I just push push myself back into the past before mm-hmm. I knew you before before I read OK Days, which is like it's so hard for me now to imagine what other book it could have been, even though I know you've written in other genres. But because that book is the book that I got to know you with. Yeah. I I don't think it wasn't that I had any strong expectation going in, but that's not to say I wasn't surprised. I actually have told people since, I don't think I've used your name, but I'm going to use your name on this podcast because people know, <laughs> about your Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> and I I have to... So, dear listeners, Jenny had this amazing Excel spreadsheet where she said, like, these are the chapters, this is how long they'll be, this is exactly what's going to happen in the chapters. I think you might even have had word counts. Yeah. Yeah. And percentages anyway percentages and um <laughs> you had laid this all out in advance and i remember looking at this and thinking wow i've never seen anyone do this so precisely <laughs> i absolutely couldn't write this way but there's nothing wrong with it like it, it, if anything i'm just deeply deeply impressed <laughs> and i'm not sure if you should be <laughs> depressed or like worried about me <laughs> it might not be like my most you know uh, it, it's not maybe my my finest side that I am a little bit of a control freak when it comes to even my creativity for sure. But you know, I think that's why maybe like I think about stuff a lot before I sit down to write, and maybe that's why I I have it quite in my head before. But you must have met so many people that write very differently, and some people have, like for example, a journalist they have written, you know, they might have been written, writing for 20 years and then they're writing a book and it can turn out different ways, but it's like, they're so used to writing. And with Jenny, you know, you had by that time written a thousand blog posts and a thousand YouTube scripts. Yeah. So it's like, you had one way of writing that, yeah. you, that, that you could just th- throw out yeah. basically like, oh, this I can do in no time. And now you did a book. Is it like, uh, do you see a lot of different kind, like someone who's used to writing compared to like someone who's 19 and writing for the first time? Is is there like a big difference between the two? Or or uh, can, can you tell? Or is it just like so a- I, anyone can be good, anyone can be bad? And So I have a theory and it could be absolutely wrong, but I accidentally stumbled on something I'd written when I was 15 and I was reading it through and on one level I was like this makes no sense (laughs) a reader could not follow this plot at all like I can only follow it because I know what I thought I can kind of remember what I thought I was doing but you know I think the the sentences I liked best in that horrible mess probably I liked as much as I like you know when you're thinking about your own work Mm -hmm that my favorite sentences I've written in something this year. And I think that's true that's of a lot amazing. of people though, is that you have, you don't have to have a lot of training to have your most insightful ideas, to have your most original images. But I think what the training does, what the practice does, is it helps you clear the way for those. And so I think when I work with people who've written less in their lives, there tends to be more muddle. Mm. And a lot of the time it feels like I'm trying to straighten out the muddle and trying to find out what the thing that they care about is in that work. But I think the core ideas, I don't know if this is uplifting or depressing, (laughs) um, are, you know, are there from the beginning and the training just helps them appear. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you you don't think that some people are just born better storytellers and some people like well, have some people to have learn. talent right what do well. you think do you think that there is like do you think that everyone needs to learn this by doing it and reading a lot or do you think that like it differs a lot with between personalities as well oh the tough question <laughs> um i i you know i haven't read a lot of novels written by babies so i'm not sure <laughs> um i baby novels <laughs> I, I, I do think also that some people we all have very different lives you know I was encouraged to read from a very young age by my parents and I'm very very lucky for that and 
I didn't think, oh, I'm training to be a novelist mm. as I read, but I think. But you were. <laughs> yeah, you were. <laughs> but when I meet a lot of writers, they describe something quite similar that it's not necessarily that they had more Zeus given talent, but that they were in an environment where either st where stories were valued, where people told stories, where people read. And that is, of course, going to make it easier. I'm pretty tone deaf because no one really played music or sang mm. in my house. Mm. And that's that i think that's fine but i do sometimes meet writers who have come to it later who didn't grow up in families where that was true where you know in fact it may even have been like a struggle to get their hands on books as children and sometimes that means that they have a steeper hill <laughs> to mm -hmm. run up in mm -hmm. the beginning and they feel like they're behind but it doesn't actually mean that they have less insight on the human condition yeah, or yeah. on being a person or less original imagery. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't want someone in that situation to feel like they were a worse writer. It's just they're doing, some people got a head start on doing yeah. that work, mm. but they'll bring something different to it because of where they're coming from. Mm. So I think that at least in my time working with people, that seems to be more true than a sense of you are have more God-given talent than the person to your left. Mm. That said, I think interest matters. Yeah. yeah. I think people who say, oh, I don't really read, I find usually aren't as strong writers because they, yeah. I mean, they're not. It's because they're not interested in it as I, much. I think I, that like that like reading is is much more important than writing. Like if you want to be a good writer, I think the reading is like like at least that's how I see it. Like you need to consume the type of content that you want to produce. Like otherwise, you you can't just write yourself into becoming a writer. You need to read yourself into be like that's how I see it. I, I I think that there's a lot of people that turn fifty and say. I want to write a book, uh, and they've never read a book. Like <laughs> I, well, that, that, there's a, like that that are just like I want to tell my story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that's and amazing. There's like, probably you know hundreds of thousands of people like that every year. Yeah. And uh, and obviously there's all. all Will you? Will you when you're fifty? I I don't think so. Mm. Ugh nightmare <laughs> to, to, to write a whole book that's I'm looking to forward to your tell-all memoir <laughs> yes exactly no but a, a lot of people are, are I think are like uh, I want to tell the story of my life yeah kind of when they're when they, they turn 50 yeah. maybe they had an office job for the last 30 years and they're like I Just have creativity yeah. in me I don't read I don't write but I love the idea mm. of writing a book. Yeah. I think it's the same with with uh, film or social media or whatever creative yeah. output, basically. But, but writing is so much more democratic because anyone can do it. Like, almost anyone can do it. So it's Yeah, like, but now anyone can do things with their phone. But not a lot of 50-year-olds wake up one day and create a movie. That's true. Yeah. Are there more 50-year-olds that say... I want to write the book, yes. then I want to make a movie. Yes. Because, yeah, it's sure. so it's... much e e easier, but it's easier to sit down and start because, yeah. like, you already you have the laptop. You don't kind of. You don't need any technical, like, knowledge or equipment or anything. With your students, do, do you... Because some of them, I guess, are like, I want to write a fast-paced uh, Da Vinci Code thing. And, like, how do you... How do you, how do you uh, teach that? person and also teach the person that wants to write the literary uh, masterpiece kind of so first off i'm always pretty straightforward with my students i go for the literary <laughs> masterpiece <laughs> no i i i primarily primarily write in the genre called literary fiction it's most of what i read and so i'll tell them my bias will be towards character development it will be towards the you know really feeling the inner life of these people and i'm not i have no problem with bloodshed but <laughs> you know I, is I wanna, that what it is, is that, can we quote you for that one? <laughs> <laughs> but i, I want to know sound bite <laughs> i, I want to know how the bloodshed makes them feel yeah. um, and you know and that and i i'll tell them you know that that is where i'm coming from that's you know what where my biases will be and so hopefully therefore they feel 
not that I'm telling them the one way to write a book, but that these are some opinions. But I do, I do actually also read crime. I really enjoy crime, and I don't again, write it. great soundbite. I really enjoy crime. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, and so I try to speak to them about books that you know maybe are much pacier than something I would necessarily be my total true love books, but mm. books that I've really enjoyed that are closer in genre to theirs, and say, okay, well, I think your book reminds me of the work by this writer. This is the technique they used. Mm. Maybe you would want to use a similar technique to achieve a similar effect. Mm. But personally, I think that the very best, quote, genre books, for instance, um, Celeste Ng's Everything I Never Told You, which is on some level a murder mystery, are also completely about character relationships they they take care with language they're doing everything a literary novel does but they're also using the sort of tropes of a particular genre and that i i don't think there's any reason you can't have dragons and good writing in one book <laughs> and there are books that do that and mm. so that, yeah that's sort of where i what, what i try to the agenda i try to push yeah <laughs> uh, okay so you mentored me then fast forward and now my uh, debut is coming out and what was funny was like really funny is that actually my book is coming out with your imprint i mean i don't own this imprint dear <laughs> they just publish my books <laughs> so you've always been with scepter right so yes. for your three books um and 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 an imprint is a publishing house yeah so can you can you explain the uk <laughs> how how it works with like the publishing house and the yeah you know. of course so i didn't understand any of this i don't before. think anyone really does like <laughs> yeah. it's quite com- confusing before i got an agent and my in my book um, I, so I have an agent who's different from Jenny's agent and my book went to auction, which means that a couple of, in my case, six different publishers wanted Ooh, to bid on it, which was fancy. very Flex. exciting. <laughs> um, but the first publisher to be interested and to preempt, which is when they say, please don't go to auction, we'll give you some money instead, mm-hmm. um, was Scepter. And they, and I was like, they're lovely. Mm. They're so nice. The editors are so nice. And my agent was like, no, there's been more interest. We will go to auction. <laughs> and As a good agent should say. <laughs> she should say. No, I'm I'm very grateful to my agent. She is amazing. Um, but and so we went we went through that process and I ended up Scepter luckily came along and did take me on take me on for that. So you kind of have your heart set on them because like they, they came to you first and they were like well, lovely. My, my editor, I was living in Norwich at the time, which for non-British people is about two hours from London. My editor got on a train to come meet me in Norwich oh. and like she brought me some books to read. Oh, it was gosh. lovely. It was so lovely. So yes, I was I was very easily wooed with yeah. books. Yeah. Um, but I yes, yeah, courting you. <laughs> don't I, expect that from <laughs> an agent. <I> don't know. <laughs> but, but but I didn't know I didn't know what anything was. So I was like, Lucy, what what is Scepter? And mm. um, she was like, Well, Scepter is an imprint of Hodder and Stoughton, who are an imprint of Hachette. Mm. And I went what yeah (laughs) and it's basically within a big publishing house that may publish cookbooks and football memoirs and you know all these different things they in order to sort of help the reader understand what's happening is this a cookbook is this not and also to have teams that specialize in and understand particular genres you tend to have imprints which will focus on something in particular. So just like a sub-publisher. Yeah. So, so it's like uh, Universal Studios or Fox. Uh, they have, uh, you know, focus features search and light. searchlights. Things I think that... it's confusing things now because people would know even less about this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, so Scepter is a, is a literary imprint of Hodder and Stoughton who are an imprint of Fichette. <laughs> so how would you uh, explain Scepter, like their kind of profile? I mean, it's it's hard because it's sort of like describing your sibling or your family. You mm-hmm. think in their particular way, mm-hmm. but to me, they are a literary imprint. They're interested in good writing, but they're also a bit quirky. So they have David Mitchell, who some of you may have heard of, is a Scepter author. They also have this 
a very fabulous man named Sean, S-J-O-N, who lives in Iceland, appears to have only one name, and writes these incredibly short, artsy novellas. Well, he wrote uh, The Northman, the uh, script to The Northman, the yeah. movie. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm. Wow. He, he wrote it together with, what's his name? Oh, Russell. Russell. The filmmaker. Oh, the, uh, Robert e- Eggers. Okay, yeah, not um, Russell at all. Eggers. And I think uh, Alexander Skarsgård had something to do with it as well. Who knows? But yeah. it, I think it was two of them who wrote. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Probably. Anyway. Probably. Yeah. He. So yeah. he's here. And and don't Fred- fact check. Uh, <laughs> and also like a fellow Swede, Fredrik Backman, who wrote "My Name Is No A Man Called Uwe." Yeah. He's here as well. Mm. So you think that they're a bit quirky? I mean, they have you, so obviously they're a little bit quirky. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I think you know they were interested in the fact that my first novel was about a Japanese artist. Mm. And so the titles of the section of the chapters were different color, different paint colors, and mm. had these descriptions of paint. And they I were- love that about your first book. I oh. really loved it. I felt like it was so. You, you know what was clever about it is like it really set the mood for the next chapter. You kind of knew what you were going into. That's really unusual. How did you come up with the idea? Well, I think because it's about an artist and she sees the world. She's quite. She sees the world through color, and color is very strongly emotionally important to her. So I had titled the chapters with these paint colors, and then someone said to me, someone did for me what I tried to do for you, said, Rowan, we don't know what Queen of Kaido and gold looks like. We don't necessarily, not all readers know what Celadon looks like. <laughs> Maybe you should describe them. But actually in describing them, I they're not straight up descriptions. They sort of have associations and meanings yeah. for that character. Yeah. And so yeah, that was that was fun to do. Mm. But but yeah, so I feel like with Scepter Books, there's quite a range of different voices that they support, but they're always qu- yeah, I they're always quite interesting to me. Mm. And it's only like it's a, like the the imprint only publishes like what, twenty titles per year or something? Like really like a small number. I think you did a much better job researching the business <laughs> side um, than I did. Exclusive club, you two then. Yeah, I mean, that's what's so weird. Like, you, how... you two are 10% of their output <laughs> next year. <laughs> but the, the, yeah, I guess we that's are. terrifying. I mean, like, Rowan, your, your book comes out in April. My book comes out in June. It's like, I feel like they're siblings or best friends, our books. But anyway, <laughs> it's so weird because I have like three good author friends and I have the same agent as one of them. I have the same imprint as you, one of my good friends, and also my third friend, her editor used to be at Canongate. She moved to Scepter and she's now my editor. So I have the editor, agent and imprint of my three good author friends. It's just like, it just felt like it's meant to be. Clearly you're calling certain things towards yourself. I mean, yourself. It's, it sounds now like I've been using you as contacts <laughs> to get in. I, but I, like, you, like, there's, you have no, like, my connection to you has nothing to do with me being with Scepter, which is it's yes, strange. Yes. It just happened that way. How okay? So how did you feel when me, your mentee, were like, by the way, I'm also going to be in your imprint? We're like, oh, can she please leave me alone already? <laughs> no, it was it it was it was great, and I think also you have like some mystique in the world. So people are like, oh, you. You know Jenny. Was she like? Oh, this is quite fun. No. Well, was... So, what do you tell them? Did you tell them about this? That's when you tell them about the spreadsheets. <laughs> she does these spreadsheets like no one else. Oh, <laughs> um, and so yeah, I think. Well, people have asked me to describe your book, and I'm like, I've loved your book, but people have met you, and I always end up being like, well, you know Jenny, and you've met her, and you know how she's quite. Like both, she's quite stylish, but in her own way, and like very, very put together and interesting. Her book is like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. That's, that's yeah, good. that's great actually. Yeah. So let's talk <laughs> put about put that on the book. Let's, let's talk about you blurbing though, because you blurb. Okay, so for those who, who don't know what a blurb is, it's like when you get a quote from mm-hmm. an author saying like, "I love this book," or yeah, like it's like it says on the on the cover on the cover of the book. So Marion Keys says, "Amazing book." I'm I'm so extremely lucky to have a, a blurb from Rowan, and when I told one of my uh, like an acquaintance I have in the industry, he's an agent. I told him like, "Oh, I, I already have a blurb from Rowan." He's like, 
if you have a blurb from a big player like Rowan, you're already like so like big in the industry <laughs> just from that. So it's like yeah. you you're a big player in the industry. Yeah, Rowan, yeah, I, I remember texting like you say no, you are, you are a big player, but you are because I see your name everywhere. You you blurb a lot. You're very generous with blurbing. But how does that feel to like? going to a bookshop and not only that your books are there, but also that your name is on other people's books. That must be quite special. I don't know, it's, it's not something I ever thought about in advance. Like I definitely dreamed of having a physical book and having a book cover. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was always like, I must get my book published before eBooks take over. Mm. Apparently eBooks aren't taking over. They're, they both exist, which is wonderful. Mm. But um, I think... Yeah, it's it's strange because I've, I've told you, Jenny, Jenny, like I very rarely recommend books in my day to day life because for me, I know this can sound nerdy, but reading is such a personal and intimate experience. And there are books that I really connect with that I never want to say, oh, you stranger who is entirely different from me will love this book as much as I do because you might not. Yeah. You, you know, no matter how skilled the writer is, and so to be asked to blurb, you're always like, "Oh, how do I, how do I do this?" And I always try to give in my blurb not just a sense of like, "Good book, five stars," but sort of the taste or spirit of the book, and the hope that kind of that... like your colours, your chapter colours that yeah. you give. The color of the book. That's like you, you usually how you blurb. You say like, "This is the mood of this," or "This is the yeah. and, flavor yeah, of this." In the hope that the person who's looking for that mood will be able to find it. Mm -hmm. That's that, I think that's great. If someone ever asks me to blurb, I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna just describe it, the flavor of it. Um, okay, so I think it's about time that we round off, and I want to tell everyone that like if you haven't read. Rowan's work yet you are seriously missing out like your um work Rowan if I would describe it to me it's like very cinematic like I still have so many like visuals from like short stories and your short stories and novels that like they just like it feels like it's a movie that I've seen like so even though your novels are like your stories are quite different in like what they're about and everything I just feel like this quality is like what for me, defines you as a writer that you like so. It just feels like you've seen it, like you've been in that place. So, um, if you want calm, beautiful, dark, and also very like cinematic, Rowan's are the books that you should buy. You can pre-order the the new one, but you can also buy. So, so the first one is Harmless Like You. Then is the second one is Starling Days, and then now your new one is The Sleep Watcher. So yes. you can you can pre-order that and that's out in April. Yes. Mm. Please pre-order it. Yeah, they please pre-order They make a difference to authors and yeah. bookshops. Yes. So and my, also Jenny's. My, yeah. my <laughs> editor actually told yeah, me way. like <laughs> pre-orders will will kind of uh, um have a have an impact on how much books how many books the bookshops will buy in. So it's actually really important. Yeah. So pre-order uh, Rowan's new book. Uh, I, I can't. I can't believe I haven't read it yet. I've, like we've talked about it so much. Uh, I've seen the cover and everything, but I still haven't read it. So I'm very eager. I I really hope you enjoy it. And um, I know I will. I already know I will. <laughs> I will blurb it. Like you, you won't even need my blurb. You know so many famous people already. But I was. I'm still gonna give you a blurb that you can put on your Amazon or whatever if you want. <laughs> I'm so excited for people to read OK Days and because. I I feel like I met this book, you know, in its adolescence. And <laughs> you have, yeah. It's become this, like, grand, mature woman. Oh, and well, I'm, I'm not sure what it has. People, <laughs> you know, to get to hear other people's takes on your characters and their love story. And, yeah. Oh, you're making me nervous now. Are you nervous as well? I'm always nervous. I'm always terrified. Yeah? It doesn't get better? <laughs> I mean, it might for you. <laughs> but it doesn't for you? <laughs> I feel like... Why do we do this, Rowan? Do you know? <laughs> it's, it's terrible. It's like some, some for, sort of abuse we do to ourselves. Yeah. Is it just because we crave the attention? <laughs> I don't know. Rowan doesn't seem as a, a, much of an attention seeker as you, no, Jenny. No, that's true. That's true. I'm much more the attention seeker. <laughs> Anything else you want us to know? Oh, it's okay. Um, uh, how long after you so now you, you've you been working on this book and you've just finished everything with it you have a cover and everything is done how long do you wait until you start on the next one I 
I tend to have very rough ideas for a long time that I sort of play with. I have a document on my computer that is may come to nothing. Oh, you have a book four document. I have a here is a little mess okay. that could <laughs> eventually be composted <laughs> into book four. Um, and, you know, it it takes me a really long time to get a sense of is this is this going to be a real thing or is this more just a mood or an idea or a feeling? Is it is it not something that is going to have a story? Mm. And I think, yeah, I have no idea. And there's a moment where you, oh yeah, I have the flow. Mm. And I wish I knew when that when that would come. But I think that I just have to cross my fingers and keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've already done it three times, so you're a pro. Yeah. You're yeah. such a pro at this point. <laughs> have you started? You started... I've started, but I'm not sure. I have two. I have two diff- different compost heaps. They ha- they're not composted yet, but I have two stinky messes <laughs> that I've, I haven't decided which one to go for yet. So we will see. I mean, I'm I'm 60k words in into one of them, so <laughs> it's already almost finished. Um, <laughs> you basically written your second novel. <laughs> well, I, I like I have drafted, but I'm gonna chuck. I'm gonna chuck a lot uh, of it. Do you have a name for book four? No, not at all. No. How did you? How do you come up? Do you always come up with the names before you give them to your editor, or do you come up with it together with your editor this or agent? Will, this will be my third book, The Sleep Watcher. Will be the first book that my editor and my agent have let me keep the working title. All right. Hmm. And my my first two books went through quite a lot of title rounds of me pulling my hair out because you know, trying to figure it out. And you know, I think some people think that the editorial process is just the author's genius being oppressed <laughs> but actually i'm incredibly grateful for the time that we spent doing that yeah because i think you know your own book so well that getting down to the essence can be tricky yeah mm. for uh, sure but you know sometimes i actually come up with a title that is like this is a great title i should write the book like i come <laughs> up with the title beforehand have you ever done that I think for a short story, but never for a novel. Ah, right, right. Uh, Killer clowns from outer space, for example. Good, good that's example. That's a that's a great movie. You all, <laughs> if you have that title, you already know like yeah. what book to write, what movie to write. Okay, anything yeah. else that you want to leave us with, Rowan, before we we let you leave the hot seat? Oh, just thank you so much for having me on your show, and it's so much fun. I always want to keep going, but uh, yeah. I mean, this is okay. Another good thing about having a mentor is that. You actually can become friends with your mentor. So now I don't have to pay you no, every time no. I see you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I mean, I, I would. I would pay you if I had to, but it's good for my bank account that I don't. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming on, Rowan. Yeah, this was you. a lot of fun. And everyone, go and pre-order Rowan's book, The Sleep we'll Watcher. Li- we'll leave links below. We will leave links below. And as soon as I read it, I will, of course, uh, all over Instagram tell my thoughts about it so stay tuned for that yes i'm a little Um, terrified no don't be i know i'm gonna love it already all right so thank you guys and we will talk to you in a week or a few weeks something like that yeah yeah thank you rowan thank you Mm -hmm. take care bye everyone bye bye